from Belfast, uh, and that's part of the UK. I'm in Ireland, so Ireland and the UK work together on your own consumers, and we've got the UK iNets. Uh, today I'm really delighted to be invited to speak on such an important subject as quality of life. I must say that five years ago when I was at meetings and somebody would give a talk on quality of life, some of the physicians and doctors tended to fall asleep. And I think that was really sad because I think to you and to us now, one of the most important things is the quality of life that you have. Yesterday I experienced several qualities of life. I left my daughter and her little two-year-old son. We had breakfast in Savannah down in Georgia. The weather was beautiful. It was uh, 75 degrees and uh, what's that in centigrade? And uh, I came to Chicago. There was a delay of three hours on my flight. When I got to Chicago, it looked like some sort of a mob or a fallout after war. Everybody was eating McDonald's. Somebody else was in. <laughs> in Chicago yesterday, and there was a delay on my flight coming here. So quality of life sort of dropped a bit. Then when I come here, came here, I met Maureen in the foyer, and it just rose again. So quality of life can change a lot. Let me see if I can work this gadget. It has a different meaning to different people, and that's very important. And as I've worked on quality of life over the last five or 10 years, I realized how much that's true. Some people like to be in the crowd. They like to be in the middle of activity. They like to be busy all the time. Just in normal life, when nothing's going right or nothing's going wrong, that's how they like to be. Some other people like to be in the wide open spaces. They like to be alone. In fact, my daughter who lives in Savannah says she'd be really happy with a good book for about a month and nobody disturbing her. Well, a hundred good books for a month. So it's a different thing to different people, so it becomes a little bit difficult to measure. Aristotle said that uh, the quality of life is determined by its activities. Now, a few years ago, I did a degree in philosophy and theology, and that was because my kids had all gone off to university and I was feeling a bit bored in the evenings. And we learned that uh, Aristotle was the father of Western culture. And I don't often agree with him, but I'm not just so sure that quality of life is determined by life's activities. So some people like to be in the fairground and in the buzz of things. Other people like to be climbing a rock face. But as I say, I'm not just sure that quality of life is all to do with activities. I think maybe a more accurate determination of quality of life is that quality of life is the discrepancy between expectation and experience. What I expect in life is different now to when I was young. And what you expect in life is different to what I expect in life. If you've got a disease, what you expect in life is a little bit different as well. So there's a discrepancy between what you expect and what you actually experience. If your expectation is to live in a lovely house in Switzerland or in the mountains in Canada, then you'd be pretty disappointed if you landed in the slums in Hong Kong. So. Expectation and experience is what uh, makes the difference in quality of life. Measuring quality of life is really difficult because I've said it's different to different people. It's to do with age. It's to do with symptoms if you have a disease. It's to do with issues. It's to do with your aspiration. It's to do with life changes. It's to do with age, it's to do with your personality. Somebody said today, if you're going to be an oncologist, you have to be an optimist. Well, I think if you're going to be in research as well, you have to be an, uh, an optimist because you have to believe that things are going to go right. You have to believe that you're going to find something around the corner. And I think that's where hope stands, where you think all the time, and we do advance in everything. If we look at uh, the treatments we had 10 years ago and we look at the treatments we have now, it's just unbelievable. So hope has to be there, and we have to be optimists. In Europe, there's an organization called the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer. It's involved with trials in different cancers, and there are different sections. There are about 12 different sections. There's a lung cancer section, a brain cancer section. And if there's a big trial going on in Europe in, in say, breast cancer, then it'll be often through the EURTC. 
and it'll go through the breast cancer section. There's also two other sections that are a little bit out with the cancers and one is the laboratory section where they look at tests and novel tests for various cancers, generally, generally mainstream cancers, and the other is the quality of life section. And in Europe they've been studying quality of life for just over 25 years now in cancer. So the ER, EURTC developed a general questionnaire that was supposed to suit all cancers with 30 questions and it was a general questionnaire and in theory it was to suit all cancers but as you know uh, cancers vary very much. This is almost not seeable I think but it's just to let you buzz through the a few of the questions. Uh, did you have trouble taking a long walk or did you have trouble taking a short walk? So lots of physical things. How, how able are you to do things? Have you felt nauseated? Again, to do with feeling. Uh, did you feel tense? Some emotional questions. Uh, have you felt worried? And then at the end there are a couple of, of long scales where if uh, quality of your health during the last week was very poor, it might be one. And if quality of health was excellent in the last week, it would be nine. Seven? Seven? I think it goes up to nine. <laughs> and the, the quality of your life as well, so that your health experience and your quality of life are two slightly different things. We realized very quickly that this isn't suitable because uh, the symptoms and problems and worries that you have, perhaps if you have a brain tumour or something different to if you have a breast tumour or if you have cancer of the colon or if you have bone disease where pain might be a big problem. And so over the years we've developed specific modules, add-on modules to those 30 questions. So we started five years ago to develop a module for NETS, neuroendocrine tumours. And we've ended up with 21 questions. First of all, you search the literature to see about the disease. So we're looking at NETS and we search the literature to see what people are talking about out there in the literature to say that is troublesome to them. Then we ask the patients and healthcare workers what they think is troublesome. So we uh, would take on board as many patients as healthcare workers because in fact it's you the patients who know how you feel and the things that worry you. And then we make a list of issues. An issue might be pain or it might be uh, depression. Uh, it might be many things and from those uh, issues we think of questions. So we turn issues into three or four questions often. So we end up making quite a long questionnaire and we test it out on a large number of patients with the disease. And each time we check this questionnaire out, we ask the patients afterwards, is there anything you'd like to add to this? Is there anything that was inappropriate? Is there anything that was offensive? Uh, is there anything that was just irrelevant? And then we reformulate a somewhat shorter questionnaire. So if you have 30 questions of the general questionnaire, and maybe initially you had 50 add-on questions, which is far too many questions to ask anybody long term. So we reformulate a much shorter questionnaire, and that was 21 questions for the net add-on module. And we test that out in a large multicultural group because, as I said, quality of life is different to different people. I used to say, for the man in the, on a farm somewhere in a wide open space in France, his quality of life and what he thinks quality of life is, is somewhat different to somebody who worked in the city in London in business. Now, in fact, their quality of life is probably dreadful at the moment, but in fact, uh, both of those people think they enjoy life but their lives are very different. So it has to be tested out and in Europe in very many languages. We're testing this questionnaire out now in 21 languages in Britain, in, in Europe. And we're seeing how people feel and how this fits in and how the translations are working. So we come up with questions that are much more relevant to neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, lots of physical questions. The first 10 questions are on physical symptoms. And I must say, as healthcare care workers, we thought that physical symptoms would be really important. Do you flush? Do you have diarrhea? Do you have to change the bed sheets at night because of sweating? 
Uh, and then we go on to uh, the emotional questions and how you're feeling. Do you feel depressed? Are you worried? Are you concerned about your next visit at hospital? Questions like that. Now, when we tested this out, uh, first of all, we found that uh, there are general symptom-related questions about weakness and pain and symptoms. There are functional issues about how, how difficult it is to do various tasks that you want to do every day of life or you want to do it at least occasionally. There are emotional issues, issues about anxiety and worrying about uh, your next treatment or your next visit to hospital or the results of your last test. There are social issues about the ability to meet with your friends and carry on the life that you've had before you got your diagnosis. And attitudes towards treatment, are there treatments that you're scared of, are there treatments that you think you're not getting that you would like to be having? And is your satisfaction with care good? Because that's very, very important. And we've had lots of questions to do with that today about second opinions and, and feeling that uh, your carers are happy to talk to other carers about you. And sexual issues as well, which are sometimes sort of rather brushed under the uh, carpet, especially if you're brought up in England, I think. I'm Irish. So when we tested out our questionnaire, first of all, it was really interesting because patients picked out five or six issues that were very important. Concern for the family and family members, anxiety about current disease, anxiety about the best treatment and what treatments were available, fear of therapy side effects. If you had a treatment, would this give you other problems that were just compounding the whole situation? And anxiety about the future. When we asked healthcare workers to fill in the same questionnaire on your behalf, then healthcare workers thought flushing, weight loss, tiredness and weakness and fatigue, lack of disease information, abdominal pain and diarrhea were the most important things. So we as healthcare workers thought the physical side of things was the most important issue, whereas you the patients thought that the emotional things were the most important uh, concerns in your mind. And that is, I think, because also you have to live with the disease. You're concerned about your treatments and so forth, and you're concerned about your symptoms without doubt. But the most important thing is the fact that this is ongoing, and your treatments are ongoing. Your family you have to find a new relationship with in some ways, and it's all very difficult. Some people say that quality of life is about relationships, and this was somebody in Canada, I believe. Uh, it's important, it's difficult to measure. We measure the symptoms, we measure the issues. We try to imagine the aspirations, and you know your aspirations. We try to anticipate the life changes. We consider age because my aspirations are different to my daughter, who's half my age, and your personality. But there's another aspect as well. There's the isolation. We all like to be in a group, not just in a group, but to have the ones that we love most understanding us in every way. And when a disease comes into a family, then the cares of the uh, person afflicted are different to the cares of those who love them round about, and that's quite difficult. Sometimes both the carers and the loved ones feel very isolated, and sometimes the patient feels very isolated too. So we have to think how important relationships are. When people are first diagnosed with any cancer, they feel angry. And that anger is most often most acute with younger folk, I think. Then there are treatment options to be considered. And 20 years ago, treatment options were decided on by your doctors. But now treatment options are decided jointly, and that's the way it should be. Some options are very difficult, and the recovery is very difficult as well. And some options have no promise whatsoever and uh, these have to be considered very carefully. And somebody once said uh, that the quality of life is more important than life itself. And I'm going to tell you a story about that. Uh, when I was just 29, I had a brother 
He was a surgeon, he was very clever, and in some ways he was my absolute hero because he was something that I was never. He did everything to the absolute best of his ability, and I have admired him so much my whole life for that. I have always been satisfied with a little bit less than, than that, I think, in my own life. He got a very nasty disease called pseudomyxoma peritoneal, and it, it's not a cancer, but it's, it's, uh, it limits life to less than five years, certainly in those days. He had operated on people with this disease, and it was a very unpleasant passage for those four years that he had. He was young, he had two young children, he had all of life ahead of him, and suddenly he had to face this uh, shortening of life. He was given eventually, after numerous uh, visits to surgery, he was offered only one option, and that was to have all of his intestines, his stomach, his uh, small intestine, his, his large bowel removed, and he would be fed by drip at night from then on. And I encouraged him. He was in the hospital that I work in, and I sat with him for many hours every day, and I said, why don't you think this is a good option? And he said, because quantity without quality is nothing at all. And it has stayed with me all through those years that sometimes an option is not an option. There has to be quality. Quantity is no good without quality. We try to measure quantity against quality now in quality of life assessment. And if I try to explain it by uh, looking at, can I do this? No. Sorry, folks. We'll go back to slides. Uh, if we look at treatments, so we're looking at the quality of life, and it's 100%, that's what the best it could be. So the quality of life is sitting there 70-80% of what it might be. And this person has had a, a diagnosis. And then they opt for a treatment that reduces the quality of life to something like 20%. But it comes up again quite quickly. Maybe just not as high as it was before, because there's been some side effects. And so the quality of life is not just as good as it was before, but still very tolerable, sitting at 70%. They have another treatment, a cycle of treatment, if this is something that comes as a cycle. And it drops away back again, and rises again, and so this goes on, and uh, this is how life is for this patient. So there's good times and there's bad times. The bad times are really bad, but the good times are really quite good. Now, there's a different quality of life for somebody who's diagnosed, and they maybe have some sort of maintenance treatment, and it's not very interventional, and their quality of life stays really very good. I've drawn it to drop off a bit, but in fact, sometimes this is not the case. Sometimes quality of life can stay up there really high all the time. So we now say that quality-adjusted life years are the difference between these two. If you didn't have any treatment at all, or you just had some maintenance treatment, your chart would be the blue chart. And if there was big interventional treatment like surgery or very interventional uh, radiology or whatever, uh, nuclear medicine, then it might be up and down and rather good days, bad days, good months, bad days, depending on when the treatment was. And the difference between these would be measured in qualies. And so we can go on to make the assumption that 10 years with times of poor quality of life that go down to 20 to 50% of your expectation or nine years of quality of life that has really stayed up there at 80% all of the time. We have to balance those. And in fact, measuring in qualities, we would say that the second option is by far preferred. Nobody makes this decision, of course, but yourself. So quality of life is important. It's difficult to measure. It's, we measure the symptoms, and that's not always what you want us to measure. We measure the issues, and that is more what you do want us to measure. We have to take into account the aspirations that you have and the life changes, the age you're at and the aspirations you have that are age-related, and your approach to life. But above all, quality of life needs hope. We all need hope in life. A hopeless situation is, is no good. So what does H stand for? It stands for your healthcare workers and the hospital. 
In Northern Ireland, in fact, we see patients mostly in hospital and uh, they come to us very frequently for their medication and for their injections unless they are on unmutide when they can self-medicate. So these people are very important. They're very important to the hope that you have because these people have the knowledge. They can talk to you. You can make them talk to you. And uh, at home we have a very uh, interesting group, and I'm sure you have them here as well, specialist nurses. Specialist nurses are very important because they can spend time with individual patients. What does O stand for? O stands for organizations. There's organizations that can help as well.